we uh, are demonstrating a weakness and a feebleness uh, epitomized by President Biden. Uh, and it is being noticed and it's being seized upon by the autocrats and the dictators around the world. We're not in a good place and, and the war in Europe will certainly occupy a lot of our attention, but it should not take away uh, our attention from the fact that there is there's a global meltdown happening here. Former Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, Marshall Billingsley, thank you so much for joining me on Global Perspectives. Thank you for having me, Ellie. It's great to be with you again. I really enjoyed working with you during the Trump administration. It well, was my honor and privilege to work alongside you. And uh, just so our audience knows, we are holding this interview today on Thursday. Last night, the Russians invaded Ukraine by land, sea and air. And yesterday at a press conference, we saw President uh, Biden announce a tranche of sanctions against Russia. We've also seen condemnation from European powers, the G7 and others of Russia. Russia's actions. Before we dig deep into what's going on between Russia and Ukraine right now, I would love, sir, your thoughts on a more global uh, thinking on what is taking place today in terms of U.S. foreign policy one year into the Biden administration. We're about a year after the Biden administration. And what we've seen in that time is Hamas raining down rockets on our ally Israel. We've seen the United States withdraw from Afghanistan in what is considered a debacle by most. And we've seen China still not held accountable for transparency and information on the coronavirus, which emanated from Wuhan, China. So, sir, again, I ask you, what is your thinking on U.S. foreign policy today and the repercussions of it? Ellie, I, I wish I were here with you under happier circumstances. As you mentioned, the Russian, full-on Russian war uh, that has started in Europe. Uh, what we're seeing is, under the Biden administration, I believe, a complete erosion of longstanding national security objectives and a complete reversal in many cases of the enormous strides that we made during the Trump administration to protect the United States and to do so without the need to employ military force. You could add to the list that you just uh, articulated other actions such as the resurgence of Hezbollah in Lebanon, such as the horrible decision within the first few days of this administration to remove the terror designation on the Houthis. Uh, who have uh, in recent days mounted uh, explosive drone attacks against the UAE and back again at the Saudi Arabians and so on. Uh, Venezuela is another case where the administration has been refusing to impose the sanctions that we had on the Venezuelan regime. And Maduro, the dictator there, is in a stronger position than, than ever. So we're not in a good place. And, and the war in Europe will certainly occupy a lot of our attention, but it should not take away uh, our attention from the fact that there is there's a global meltdown happening here. Thank you so much for bringing all of those other issues up. And um, and that's exactly what I have been thinking and hoping that you would address. A global meltdown is exactly what it feels like. Uh, it seems that in every direction that we turn, there is um, a weakening of U.S. Um, U.S. strength, a weakening of the United mm -hmm. States as the leader of the free world. And we're seeing almost a rise in dictatorships, in oppression everywhere as a result of that. Would you agree with that assessment? Yes. Look, when it comes to these dictatorships, Ellie, weakness begets aggression. Uh, to put it the other way around, as Ronald Reagan uh, famously said, peace through strength. We are not demonstrating strength. We uh, are demonstrating a weakness and a feebleness uh, epitomized by President Biden. Uh, and it is being noticed and it's being seized upon by the autocrats and the dictators around the world. And so getting back to the autocrats and dictators around the world and to our pressing situation with Russia and the Ukraine today, 
What do you think the repercussion of Russia's war, as you described it, against Ukraine is for Americans and the United States? You know, Vladimir Lenin uh, famously said, take your bayonet and, and if you encounter mush, push. If you encounter steel, withdraw. Vladimir Putin clearly has decided in the case of the United States and frankly, many of our allies, that they're seeing mush. Uh, as we record this, we are awaiting the president of the United States to deliver a speech, which frankly he should have given last night in, as the invasion began. Uh, but uh, here in a few hours, uh, we expect President Biden to tell us, is he really going to implement the swift and severe, and I'm quoting, the swift and severe consequences that he has now been threatening for a month. So far, the measures that he's taken have neither been swift nor severe. And as a result, Putin took his calculus and invaded. May I ask why you think this is important for the American people? You know, there are some voices that are um, sharing ideas like, for example, this is a post-Cold War environment. Uh, perhaps if we had um, taken different steps in terms of letting Russia and Putin know that Ukraine would not join NATO, then we wouldn't be here today. What do you think of that train of thought? I think it's terribly misguided. And I've been greatly concerned to hear a clamor of voices, including within the Republican Party, uh, talking that way. Uh, I would start, <clears throat> first of all, with reminding people of the vision that President Reagan set out, which is that the United States is a beacon upon a hill. We have played from our inception the role of the guiding light for freedom-seeking peoples around the world. And I believe we should continue to do so. But even more practically, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia is already having enormous economic consequences here and abroad. And the American people who are now suffering under inflation because of Joe Biden's terribly misguided domestic policies are going to see a compounding of that in the coming days as the price of gasoline at the pump goes up, as we have grocery shelves that remain unstocked because of supply chain differences, we also now have Ukraine, the, Europe's breadbasket, as it's called, uh, under increasing occupation by Russian forces. So when those fields that produce, uh, it's, Ukraine's one of the largest producers of potatoes and tomatoes and wheat, when those fields go fallow because the farmers have all fled as refugees into Western Europe, we're going to feel that effect as well. On top of that, Ukraine is a major supplier of the minerals that we need for everyday household items here in the United States. And Russia is about to take those mines offline. So we have a wide range of, of interests and reasons to stay engaged. Nobody that I know is advocating for, uh, for the use of force in Ukraine, for the deployment of soldiers. Ukraine is not a NATO ally, but they are a democracy and they are a European friend and we should do everything within our power to hold Putin accountable, those around him accountable, and to deliver a crushing economic blow on Russia to cause this violence to stop. I, and, you know, there's so much to unpack in what you just said. I want to go back to what the United States can be doing in response to Putin. But before we discuss that, I'd like to talk a little bit about energy policy, because there is a huge aspect of this crisis. I think that we would, you know, I would appreciate us talking about the Trump administration, President Trump specifically uh, sanctioned the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which, um, which is meant to export gas from Russia into Europe. Since the Biden administration came into office, they reversed these sanctions, and it seems to have lionized uh, Putin, and it obviously gives him greater economic resources. At the same time, I should say at the same time, the United States, we were energy independent under, under the Trump administration. Now uh, we, we shut down our own energy capabilities, and so now we have now become energy dependent again immediately after Biden comes into office. What are your thoughts on all the energy policies here and what we should be doing differently? Ellie, I'm, I'm no expert on energy policy, but I will, having sat opposite the Russians and negotiated with them 
against them on arms control topics, both during the Bush and Trump administrations. I can tell you that if you have a president who sails into office and immediately kills the Keystone Pipeline in the United States with a stroke of a pen, who puts the United States on a vulnerable path towards energy dependency, as you just said, and then at the same time, green lights construction of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline by the Russians, explicitly designed to bypass Ukraine, which is where the per current pipeline runs, that was taken as a sign of serious weakness by the Russians. And it fueled their calculus, as did the horrific withdrawal from Afghanistan. It fueled their calculus that Biden is a weak and feeble president who will not stand up to Putin. So today is Biden's chance to prove Vladimir Putin wrong. I really hope he does so. And, and I want to just stay on energy for one more moment before we get back to what Biden should be doing today in, in his address uh, just shortly. We saw not too long ago the State Department uh, let our allies, Israel, Greece and Cyprus know that they no longer support the East Med natural gas pipeline, which was meant to bring natural gas from Israel through Greece and into Europe. It's kind of astounding to many of us that the Biden administration would take such a move while at the same time, again, they greenlighted the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. What do you think is going on there with the Biden administration and these policies towards Israel versus Russia? Uh, Ellie, the Biden administration's energy energy policy is 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 haywire. It's completely uh, run amok. Uh, the idea to uh, do a complete about face and tell the countries you just mentioned, uh, particularly Cyprus, who is who has moved out of the Russian orbit and is increasingly pro-U.S., to tell these countries that they no longer support that pipeline is is an absolute disaster. I mean, just think about the value of having Egyptian and Israeli gas transiting into Europe through Cyprus. There's nothing but benefit uh, to everyone involved and to U.S. national security. But, you know, the, the administration's disastrous energy policies go well beyond that. Just think about what they're now doing by allowing, in violation of the, uh, of the Caesar Act, allowing... Uh, electricity and, and bills to be paid to Assad in Syria for electricity to be pumped into Lebanon. Uh, yet another example. And, and finally, I'll just conclude by saying it, it's surreal. Today you had uh, on, on the, in the pages of the Washington Times, you had quotes from John Kerry, the climate czar, uh, talking about he, how he hopes that the war in, in Europe won't uh, detract Putin's willingness or detract from Putin's willingness to tackle climate change. I mean, this is, it's just, it's, it's really surreal what is going on here. It is surreal. And, and so just to continue on, on that note, I wanted to also ask you about the Vienna talks, which are apparently still ongoing. And so in these Vienna talks, what we have right now is that the Iranians refuse to sit face to face with the U.S. And until now, we've been depending on our adversary, Russia, the other adversary, China, to negotiate on our behalf with the third adversary, Iran. So I'm just curious your take on that and, uh, and given all of your experience in, uh, in, in negotiating with Russia on behalf of the United States. Well, I would offer two thoughts on that, Ellie. Uh, the first is that uh, it is surreal, again, surreal, that we have subcontracted our negotiation with the Iranians out to our enemy, the Russians. We're not in the negotiating room with the Iranians. We're not talking to them directly. We're talking to them through a country that has diametrically opposed objectives to ours and who is now engaged in warfare against a friendly nation in Europe. And that is just, that's just outrageous. It was a bad idea to begin with, and it's become an unsupportable fact now. The second point here uh, is that, as you know, while at the Treasury, I was one of a few people that led the effort to impose crippling sanctions on the Iranian regime to stop the terrorism, to stop the ballistic missile program, and to put a dent in their nuclear ambitions. Iran has every intention of, develop of developing a nuclear we weapon. 
And we're now at a moment, at a juncture, where the Biden administration, in order to cozy up to the Iranians, has already started non-enforcement of the sanctions that we put in place. And the result is billions that have flowed not just into the coffers of the, the Ayatollah, but into the coffers of terror groups like Hamas, like Hezbollah, like the Houthis, all of whom are directly bankrolled by the Quds Force uh, and, and the IRGC. Exactly right. And so um, I, I want to ask you about that. I mean, can the Biden administration actually, on the one hand, be on the verge of some sort of a conflict with Russia over Ukraine? And on the other hand, in the next week or so, announce an Iran deal, which the Russians negotiated for us? Well, that's their game plan. And uh, mark my words, what they're going to do is they're going to say, oh, well, actually, this deal with the Iranians is good on two points, not just because it puts uh, restraints back on their nuclear weapons ambitions, which it won't, but also because we need their oil. So they're going to argue that because Russia and the energy production that Russia uh, uh, represents is going to be affected and probably degraded through sanctions, hopefully degraded through sanctions, they're going to turn around and argue that we actually need to bring the Iranian oil production back online and then watch them because they'll pivot and try to do the same thing with the dictatorship in our hemisphere, Venezuela. It's, it's really concerning stuff. And, and all I can hope is that the American people will, uh, will be aware and not buy this. And see uh, through it. That's yeah, right. see That's through right. it. See through it. it because it, it just feels like at this point we're being fed straight out propaganda from this administration. And so, Marshall, now I would um, love to take us back to, again, this crisis in Russia and Ukraine today. What would you like to see the United States do now in response to Putin's invasion? I'd like to see President Biden do this afternoon what he should have done two weeks ago, which is put severe economic consequences on Russia for what Putin has just done. Two weeks ago, he should have imposed the measures I'm about to lay out and signal to Putin that just as quickly as we put sanctions on, we can take sanctions off. But the trade-off is those Russian forces should have been forced to go back to garrison, to where they came from. Biden didn't do that. He adopted a wait and see strategy and then at the last moment engaged in a number of pinprick actions, basically re-sanctioning a number of people that we'd already sanctioned, added a few more to the mix, uh, and then sanctioned a, a a large Russian bank, but one that was specifically designed by Putin to be fireproof to, to U.S. sanctions. So, so far, Joe Biden has not shown, well, he's definitely shown he doesn't know how to deter Russia. Now the question is, will he adopt measures that will cause Russia to pause in the slaughter of, of innocent men, women, women, and children in Ukraine? The measures he needs to take, and I'd, I'd almost give this in priority order, Mm -hmm. And these are all measures that we have done before in other contexts, such as Iran or Venezuela. That inevitably leads to the third point, which is removal of Russia from the SWIFT system, which is the payments processing system that's used by banks to communicate on how to settle uh, trade balances back and forth with one another when you, when you export or import goods. <clears throat> Add to that sanctions on Putin himself for what he's done. He's reportedly one of the wealthiest men in the world. We need to make him recognize how vulnerable he is. Sanction those around him. Sanctions on big oligarchs, like the ones that we imposed during the Trump administration, not the pinprick little sanctions uh, that were done just a few days ago by Biden. <clears throat> export controls, complete set of export controls uh, so that you have to go to the Department of Commerce to get a license for anything you want to ship to Russia. Finally, uh, sanctions, sectoral sanctions, or I should say next to last, sectoral sanctions on the things Russia exports. Outright sanctions on minerals and timber and stuff like that. But also, and you don't want to shoot yourself in the foot, so I would not sanction exports of Russian oil or gas. What I would do is require, like we did in the case of Iran, that when you buy Russian oil or gas, you can only deposit that money into a non-Russian financial institution that's outside of Russia and that it goes into a blocked escrow account so that they can't tap it for their war efforts. Those are the measures I think we should take. 
Well, Marshall, and as you just told us, um, these are measures that the Trump administration took against Iran, against Venezuela. The United States has full experience and knowledge on how to go about waging these sanctions against another country. Are you optimistic that the Biden administration will do so? No, I'm not. Sadly, I'm not. <clears throat> Hope springs eternal. Uh, I pray that they will. But I'm not. Uh, I was watching TV this morning and uh, I saw on Fox News, one of the reporters said she'd been told by a White House insider that Joe Biden's not going to do anything without the G7. That's not leadership. Uh, Biden needs to lead from the front. He needs to set the tone. He needs to make very clear that the measures I just laid out are the measures that he's going to take. Frankly, success in implementing everything I just said is not dependent upon the Europeans. It certainly would be nice to have them with us, but we don't need them to achieve any one of those things, and we don't need them with us. You know, and, and I'd love to talk about Vladimir Putin, president of Russia, uh, as a person, the, the, you know, what's going on with him personally on the human side. So, so one thing we saw yesterday was that he issued a threat, which was pretty clear uh, the threat was against the United States and Europe. And what he said in this threat was that if there should be any intervention by outsiders in his uh, war and invasion of Ukraine, this is what he said, that it will, quote, lead to consequences you've never faced in your history. And he seems to be implying something about their nuclear capabilities. What do you think Putin's assessment is on Joe Biden and the West as he issues this kind of threat to us? Ellie, I'm, I'm not a psychologist or psychotherapist, um, but I have been in the room with Vladimir Putin. I will tell you he has dead eyes, dead fish eyes. Uh, there's no soul there. Uh, this is a man who... Uh, to, you know, you, you, you led efforts to fight anti-Semitism around the world, and some of the rhetoric coming out of Vladimir Putin is virtually identical to what we heard from Hitler when he announced the Anschluss. Uh, it, it's truly staggering, the kind of verbiage coming from this, this dictator. On top of it, as you just point out, he very much threatened us with a nuclear strike. There's no doubt about it. In fact, just a few days ago, as he was preparing for the invasion, he cycled up Russian nuclear forces into a full-on exercise. And they were testing ICBMs and submarine launch ballistic missiles. So I'd say we got the message loud and clear, but certainly there are those of us who are not at all deterred by this. You've got to stand up and, and combat this evil uh, in, in everywhere that it rears its ugly head. Indeed, my next question to you is, what do you think the significance of this moment is for Europe? Are we expecting complete destabilization? What do you imagine happens next? I've been in this discussion with you, fairly critical of, of Joe Biden, um, as you might expect. I will say that Biden has done a number of things well, and he should get credit for them. One of the things that he's done well is he's held the NATO alliance together. He's kept the French and the Germans on the reservation while all their instincts were opposite. They wanted to go off and negotiate their own deals uh, with Putin, uh, but he kept them in check. And he has successfully coordinated, while I've, I've been disappointed in the sanctions that he's mounted so far, he has successfully coordinated with the UK, uh, with the EU, and very importantly, with our Asian allies like Japan and Australia, to really make clear to Putin that this is a, a global pushback that Russia is going to experience. Another thing that, that Biden and his team, I believe, have done very well is they have effectively disarmed Russian disinformatia, uh, the disinformation and the agitprop that uh, the, the Kremlin and its proxies were putting out there, you know, arguing that Ukraine was conducting genocide in the Donbass and, and such things. Uh, they've done a very, very good job with that. It's just where there's room for improvement that I, I hope this afternoon we'll see a much more muscular use of financial tools than we've seen the Biden administration employ in any context, in any situation around the world to date. Marshall, I know our time is running out, so I have one last question for you, and that's the Chinese Communist Party. 
What yes. What are your thoughts on where, uh, what's the CCP thinking right now? Are they taking lessons from the situation? What's your assessment on that? I believe they definitely are. Um, Chairman Xi uh, came to power pledging reunification, in their words, of Taiwan uh, by force if necessary. Uh, and uh, as he you know, nears the end of his third term in office, um, the deadline for him making good on that promise draws ever closer. I believe that timetable has probably moved up because of what they've seen out of the Biden administration. So the coming hours actually are going to be vital, uh, not just in the context of Ukraine and Putin's calculus, but in terms of what Xi is thinking about doing in the future. You know, the we're very fond of saying in Washington, Ellie, that elections have consequences, and, and, and boy, do they. They have consequences for the American people uh, with our economy in tatters. Uh, they had consequences for the people of Afghanistan. They're now having consequences for the people of Ukraine, and I pray not in the future for the independent people of Taiwan. Exactly right. Uh, I, it's, it's, it's a very heavy moment that you and I are having this interview and this conversation. Um, I am with you and hoping that we will see American leadership in a few hours, although with you also that uh, I'm not optimistic. But um, thank you so much for joining me on Global Perspectives. And, uh, and I hope for all of us that, uh, that you and I will be wrong. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. I would love to be proven wrong in this case. Thank you for having me, Ellie. It was a joy to be with you today under these circumstances. Thank you again. Thank you.